Migraines are a type of headache that we get. Everybody pretty much knows what a migraine is. Um, there's three different types, three major categories of headaches that you can get. Um, we're gonna focus on migraines, but I put this slide up here so that we can kind of see the difference. Uh, we have tension headaches and that's the most common one. That's the one that most people get are the tension headaches. So the tension headaches are um, the ones where you feel like you have a band wrapped around your head and or they'll feel like you have something it's like pressure on the top of your head or around like over the top of the eyes and around the back that's usually a tension headache and there's so many different things that can cause tension headaches um, but that's the most common one you see then we have the migraines and the clusters so the migraine headaches are usually they usually occur on one side of the head and they usually, the main part of where it hurts is gonna be like behind the eye or above the eye. Um, and then it can kind of ram horn backwards like that. So it's usually on one side. Now cluster headaches are a little different. Uh, cluster headaches are usually like right in that eye area, usually behind it or right, you know, around that eye area. and most people who have cluster headaches describe it as feeling like someone is stabbing them in the eyeball with a knife. That's what it feels like. So that's a cluster headache. But again, we're gonna focus on the migraines. So the migraines, like I said, are usually unilateral. They can be mild or very, very severe. Um, let's go ahead and look at some of their other aspects. They're not 100% sure of the cause of migraines or the patho of migraines, like why this person gets migraines and this person doesn't get migraines. They don't really know for sure about like the incidence of that yet. Now the prevalence is if children get migraines, they're more prominent in boys. When adults get migraines, it's more prominent in women. And then we have triggers. Now triggers are a very important thing to talk about with migraines because they can be different for different people. Some people's migraines get triggered by food smells. Some people's migraines get triggered by perfume. Some get triggered by stress. So they can be individualized. Some people are more sensitive to some triggers than other people are. But here are some of the triggers. Stress obviously is going to trigger migraines. So let's talk about um, let's talk about stress a little bit. One thing that stress does in the body is it triggers the fight or flight. Now, if you remember when I talked about fight or flight, fight or flight causes peripheral vasoconstriction. But you have to remember the fight or flight is survival mode. So it's trying to make sure that your core stays very oxygenated, your brain, your heart, and your lungs, all of that stays oxygenated. So the blood vessels there are gonna dilate, okay? Because you're trying to get blood to the heart, lungs, and brain. This is why stress can trigger migraines because it triggers vasodilation up here in the head. And that is one of the things that causes that headache to start is vasodilation. So stress can be a big trigger for migraines. Uh, so the, some of the other ones we have here, hormonal changes. Hormonal changes can cause problems with um, vasoconstriction and dilation as well. Um, tyramine rich foods, that's another one. Um, so that would be things like aged cheeses, red wines, aged meats, uh, artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners, that would be things like saccharin or um, what's the other one? Aspartame, those are big ones for the artificial sweeteners. So if you have a patient who they're not gonna say, you know, every single time I eat aspartame, I get a headache. They're probably gonna say, every single time I drink a Diet Coke, I get a headache, okay? So just make sure you understand where, that, where those artificial sweeteners are. They're in a lot of the sugar-free foods or the lower sugar foods. And they're also, um, you, can just get, you can just get packets of them too, like if you're gonna put it in your coffee or something like that as well. Now, caffeine. Caffeine's another one. that It's a tricky one because caffeine can be a trigger, but caffeine can also help. So that one can go either way. Some of the, one of the drugs to treat migraine actually has caffeine in it, but 
caffeine can also be a trigger. So that one can go either way. Another one that's interesting is alcohol. Alcohol can be a major trigger for migraines. Now the alcohol can cause a migraine during drinking or alcohol can cause the migraine the next morning during your hangover. So um, alcohol can give you a double whammy. Sometimes it'll do both. Now the reason alcohol can trigger during drinking, al alcohol contains histamine. And we know histamine in the body is part of the inflammatory response. And what do we remember about inflammation? Vasodilation. Okay, so vasodilation, inflammation, that's going to cause a headache. Uh, so this is why we usually teach migraine patients to stay away from alcohol because it can trigger that um, vasodilation. Um, okay, so those are just some triggers. Let's take a look now at symptoms. So obviously the number one symptom of a migraine is the headache, the pain. Now remember we said the pain is usually unilateral, so it happens on one side of the head, and it's usually supra or retroorbital and pulsating. What that means is it's usually supra above or retro behind the eye and pulsating and it gets worse when they move around. Some other symptoms that can be associated with migraines, nausea and vomiting. That's a very common uh, associated symptom with migraine. Photophobia, that's the fear of light or, or being sensitive to light. And then photophobia is being sensitive to sound. Now, another thing that about 20% of migraine cases have is something called an aura. So an aura can be a uh, strange sensation that the patient feels, a strange taste, a strange smell. It can be something that they see. This picture here, there's actually nothing wrong with this picture. It looks like it's smeared, but this is actually a picture of what an aura may look like to somebody who's about to have a migraine. So the auras can be like a warning sign. They can tell you that a migraine's coming. So this is real, if somebody gets an aura, this is a good time for them to take their medications to stop their migraine. So again, so this would be like, they'll see strange colors. Um, they will see, they'll taste like some, some of them say they taste like metal in their mouth or something like that. So it's just something different. It can be unique to the person, but this is why you ask the person when you're assessing them, what symptoms do you see that happen right before the migraine starts and what happens during the migraine? And that way you can tell them, oh, so you see, you see like a rainbow before your eyes, before your migraine starts? Okay, that's called an aura. That's your warning sign that one's coming. And then you also want to talk to the patient about keeping a trigger diary and saying, okay, after your migraine's resolved, think back to what you were doing, drinking, eating right before it happened. Write that down and then see if you notice a pattern. Is it every single time you drink Diet Coke that you get a migraine? Is it every single time you go to your friend's house who has 17 Glade plugins? Is that what gives you a migraine? What is giving you the migraines? So the trigger diary is also an important thing to talk about. Now these symptoms of migraines can last four to 72 hours. That means four hours to three days these migraines can last. You'll notice too, patients will say that their symptoms are similar with every migraine, meaning if when you get a migraine, you get nausea and vomiting, you'll probably get nauseous and or vomit with every migraine that you get. Now again, this is the usual things that happen to patients. You may know someone who, whose story is a little different that maybe it doesn't work that way for them, but you have to remember what we teach in here is what happens to most people. Now interventions, if pain is the number one problem with the migraine, then the number one intervention is pain management. This is gonna be your priority for migraines. People usually don't die from migraines, but they can be pretty stinking miserable from them. So this is why your number one priority with migraines is pain management. And then we can also manage the symptoms. We can give them anti-nausea medications. We can put them in a dark room, in a quiet room. These are some other things that we can do for them. So let's talk now about medication. So if our number one priority intervention is going to be pain management, then 
we need to learn about the pain meds that will manage migraines. So there's two major categories of pain meds to manage migraines. There's abortive and preventative. Abortive are the drugs that you take when you feel an aura or uh, when the migraine starts, okay? So the abortive ones you take after the migraine or the aura starts to stop the migraine, okay? The preventative drugs are the drugs that you take every day regardless of symptoms to keep the migraines away, okay? So that's the difference between these two. The abortive you take to stop the migraine, so you take those during an aura or during the migraine, Preventative you take every day regardless of symptoms. Okay, so let's first talk about the abortive. These are the ones we're going to take when we feel a migraine coming on. We usually start these drugs at the lowest dose possible and then they will increase the doses until you get the desired effect of the migraine going away because we want to try to keep these at the lowest dose possible. So let's talk first about the triptans. The triptans, a very good example of that would be sumatriptan. These drugs help by vasoconstricting. If vasodilation in the brain is what's causing the problem and causing the migraines, then we'll take a drug that will constrict that. These drugs not only help, um, and actually the triptans and the ergots both help with pain, but they also help with nausea, vomiting, and they help with photophobia. So they can help with all of those things. A couple of things we have to be careful about with both the triptans and the ergotamines. Number one, we have to make sure that the patient does not have a history of heart disease of any kind or any history of angina, like chest pain. So if you have a patient who says, I have a history of coronary artery disease, or you have a patient that says, I have a history of three heart attacks, or I have a history of two stents in my heart, that is all considered a cardiac history. If this patient has any problems with his coronary arteries at all, then we would probably want to avoid these meds. If you already have problems like angina or chest pain or um, coronary artery disease, or you've had stents placed or anything like that, you don't want to constrict those coronary arteries any more than they already are. Okay, so again, we're going to avoid triptans with heart disease, angina, things like that. We're going to have the patient call us if they feel any chest pain too, because you have to think some people have heart disease and don't know they have heart disease until we give them a drug that vasoconstricts. Then they find out that they have heart disease very fast because then they develop chest pain. Other thing, we have to make sure that they take the drug as prescribed. If they take it more often than they're supposed to, they can actually develop a rebound headache, which can be worse. And if you have a patient that by chance is prescribed something like sumatriptan and cafe ergot, he's prescribed both of them. One thing we have to teach the patient is don't take them within 24 hours of each other. Meaning if you're taking a triptan for a migraine, you have to wait 24 hours before you can take an ergot. Okay, that's the hard part of the abortive drugs. Now let's get into the easy stuff. First, we have the Fiora set, which is the acetaminophen, caffeine, and butalbital. That's one of those drugs. That's a combination drug. That's that multimodal therapy. And then we have NSAIDs. NSAIDs, naproxen is an example of that. Ibuprofen is another one. The NSAIDs and the Fiora set, those two are ones that are going to be given for more mild cases. And then the triptans and ergots would be given for the more moderate to severe cases. Okay, let's move on to the preventative therapy. Now, one thing you'll notice about the preventative therapy is the preventative drugs are all drugs we usually give for something else. We have the anticonvulsants and we have the cardiac drugs, the calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Now, be careful because these particular drugs that I have listed here are the drugs that are approved for migraine therapy. Not all beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are approved for migraine therapy. It's these ones in particular. But basically what these drugs do in one way, shape, or form or another is they decrease neuron excitability. And you have to remember if neurons are transmitting pain signals, 
these drugs would be helpful because they decrease the excitability so they'll slow down that pain signal transformation. That's one of the things they do. Another thing that they do by decreasing neuron excitability is they also decrease how easily triggered a patient is to get a migraine. This is why you take these drugs every single day regardless of symptoms because they will decrease how easily triggered you are. You have to think about these aren't going to work as effectively to stop a migraine as they are to prevent a migraine. Okay, they're going to prevent better because they decrease how easily triggered you are. So again, remember the drugs that are used for preventative are all drugs that you would commonly use for something else. So if you look at a drug on an exam and you go, is that preventative or abortive? Say to yourself, can you use that for another condition in the body? Because if you can, then it's probably a preventative drug. I mean, now if you look back at the abortive, you'll see triptans, ergots, those are exclusively for migraine. Fioracet, that's exclusively for migraine. Now NSAIDs, you use those, but you usually pop those for pain, for pain of, of some kind, right? For inflammation and pain. You don't usually use those for like, you know, kidney disease, something like that. You don't use it for something else. It's usually used to decrease inflammation and pain. Whereas if you look at the uh, these drugs here, anticonvulsants, these can also be used for seizure. Calcium channel blockers, verapamil, that can be used for heart rate and blood pressure. Beta blockers, heart rate and blood pressure. So if you can see that it's used for something else, then that's probably a preventative drug.